there's no more apologies. So, uh, we'll resume our October tonight. Right then. Get ready, Jeremy and Andrew Purchase, both from Cobra Friends. Okay, brothers, at this point, I'd like to now introduce our guest speaker for the day. His name is Bernard Tutunchi. He is the National Director of Aid to the Church in Need. He's an Australian writer, speaker, and commentator. Bernard holds a Bachelor of Theology from the Catholic Institute of Sydney and a Master of Theology from the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and the Family, Melbourne. He has undertaken further studies at the Theology of the Body Institute, Pennsylvania, USA, and at St. Andrew's Greek Orthodox Theological College in Sydney. Vernon has a particular interest in questions of anthropology, morality, and truth. He lectures and tutors in theology at a university level and has co-authored a book titled Family and Human Life. Um, at the end of 2012, Bernard married Jane, and in the months leading to the wedding, he wrote a weekly record of his journey at www.proposaltomarriage.com. These entries were published in the Catholic Weekly and recorded as podcasts for xt3.com and radio.org.au. Bernard and Jane have five children. Bernard speaks at parishes, schools, and conferences on topics of faith, morality, and the Christian vision of the human person. And he's coming yeah. from Sydney today, especially to be to attend our seminar and speak about the aid to the church in need. Please welcome Bernard to Tunji. Should I check that video with you now or just so when I get to it? Well, we need to check that. Let's just show where we're going. I think I've enabled it now. Not in terms of social media. Good afternoon, gentlemen. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was a an easy trip here this morning. So uh, it's really good to be here. I'm grateful for the invitation to join you. So I might be the right place. Yeah. Greetings to all those who are online. I'll look at the camera sometimes. Um, I was asked to talk about, well, it's quite broad. I'm going to talk about, actually, you bring the, uh, the PowerPoint up if you want. Um, and just, just keep on to. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put there. that on screen and I'll share that. So just give me Could a have called a lot of things, but I've called it for the one something martyrs and suffering Christians and aid to the church in need. Um, and we'll speak sort of a little bit about both. Uh, I was able to speak to um, Dominic Amato's branch uh, during well, a few months ago, and um, they invited me to talk to you, so it's great to be here. I brought with me some materials. Uh, I'm not really going to heavily promote them, but I brought, just to let you know, those big book things are our activity report, the Vacant Church and Ed International, which I'll talk about in a second, who we are, what we do. Uh, there's some brochures and materials, and, and I was told bring them because, you know, some people might want to go and uh, bring them back to their parish, and you're most welcome to do that. So I'm not carting all the books back to Sydney, so <laughs> please feel free to take whatever you'd like. I'll talk about it a little bit more. And I think this clicker works. Uh, <clears throat> Just try it. Oh, I'll put it on. If not, I'll have been to the first time. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. All right, we're going to talk about suffering Christians, first of all, and, and what that is, and I'll get on to aid to the church in need. So um, I don't think you can all read it. It's not a lot of text on it, but I'll use it a bit. So today, in, in the world today, it's uh, it's said that about 100,000 Christians, uh, they're killed each year as a direct result of being Christian. So this isn't just people who were Christian and crossing the road got hit by a bus, but this is Christians who were killed for their faith in Christ. Um and another 200 million of them, 200 million Christians, suffer persecution or oppression of some kind, again, for their faith in Christ, for being Christian. So Christians are uh, the most persecuted group of people in the world. Um, and Christ told us about this. The Lord warned us, and he said that, you know, you're going to have a tough time uh, being Christian. 
But even today, though, in our Christian community, in the Catholic community, um, in schools and parishes, unfortunately, a lot of people certainly think of Jesus as um, I said, many of you know Christ is Jesus, and he is Jesus, of course, as you know, but a sort of gentle advocate of, of all things that are nice. And he is a nice guy, of course, Jesus, but he's also um, more than that, he's also called us to something very high. So this is a picture of Jesus, and it's I think that's some people's perception of the Lord and and who he is, and, and he does, you know, like sitting with children as well, but he's called us a lot, and he said a lot. And he said these words, if the world hates you, know that it hated you before it hated, uh, it hated me before it hated you. They're very confronting words for Christians, I think, and I don't know if people like to, maybe they gloss over them and stick with other passages that are more comforting, but if we think about the Lord, think about uh, the scriptures and the gospels, we need to think about everything that the Lord has said. So in this instance, talking about suffering and persecution, Christ has warned us that if we choose to follow him, to be uh, one of his one of his name, then we're going to have difficulty along the way. Um, so this leads into this topic of you know Christian persecution. If we think about the symbol of Christianity, obviously it's the cross, and it's become quite um, common in our mind. We don't think, give it a second thought. People see a cross on a wall with or without uh, a corpus Jesus on it, and we think, well, that's just the symbol of Christianity. But it's an instrument of torture. I mean, an equivalency would be having someone in an electric chair as a symbol of a religion. It's a very strange thing that our saviour, the founder of our faith, um, the symbol of our faith is actually an instrument of torture. So there's a lot going on when we think about, well, this is our faith. What is what is our faith calling us to? So it relates to uh, what we're going to go into. There's some scriptures there I was going to present. Um, there's plenty more you could choose. I just chose three. Matthew 5. The Lord says, blessed are you and men revile you, and they persecute you. The great your reward in heaven. You're probably reading this ahead of me. In Luke 23, if they've done this to the green wood, which of course is Christ, what are they doing to the dry wood? And that, that's us, obviously, trying to do what we can. And in 1 Peter 4, if people insult you before you follow Christ, you're blessed. And if you suffer because you're a Christian, don't be ashamed. So, and this is a very small selection of quotes, but right through uh, the New Testament, that's the story of the early church. In fact, as you probably know, Christianity spent its first 300 years under persecution. That's the story of Christianity. And it didn't just stop then, it continued. So that's that's the early church there. It's a common image. But if you were uh, looking for some entertainment in the afternoon in ancient Rome, you'd go down to the Colosseum and see the Christians being devoured by lions. And that was what Christians knew, and Christianity sort of lived with this as part of what it was, like I said, for the first uh, 300 years or so. But it didn't stop then. I think people think maybe that Christian persecution ceased then, and, and in some people's minds, it wasn't until the advent of, um, of ISIS and the persecution went on in the Middle East where it became um, more in people's face that Christians are persecuted, and there was a symbol that they would draw on the house of the Christians, the ISIS um group saying this is a christian home you know it was very much this idea of christians as someone we don't want to be associated with and there was a, a famous image at that time of a group of um men in orange overalls who were marched onto a beach and they were beheaded for being christian except one man who wasn't christian initially but he was so impressed by the witness those men gave right up to the end uh he was willing to join them and to uh to lose his life as well for this this great God that obviously they were willing to die for. So there's something about this, this um, idea of sacrifice that's done something for Christianity. Italian said this famous quote, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of Christians. And I've spoken to uh, uni kids about this and they probably don't understand it as well as you do. Why is the blood of the martyrs the seed of Christians? Because, you know, obviously to suffer uh, for faith says something very loudly that can't be just said with words. When you're willing to lose something for something greater, people are going to stop and say, well, what's this greater thing uh, that, you're, that you're giving up, that you're losing? And, and do I want to be associated with this? And I was in a high school um, a couple of weeks ago. I did some versions of, of these bits of this talk, uh, some of these parts. And um, one chap said, look, I can't understand what you, this was year 12, I think, or year 11. He said, I can't understand what you're saying. If you're saying that, this Jesus guy, and most of these kids in the Catholic high school weren't Catholic, um, actually, and now they're thinking he was either, he didn't have a Christian family. He said, I don't understand. If you're saying that Jesus 
He's saying that you're going to be persecuted if you follow me. And if people are being persecuted for following him, then why on earth would everyone join the Christians? I said, well, this is a very good point. It's exactly uh, a good question to be asking. And he said, but if that kept on happening, no one would join. I said, yes, you would think that no one would want to be a Christian. But it's inversely true that the more suffering that seems to go on by Christians, the more Christianity takes on a new dynamism, takes on a new energy, and people are drawn into this faith, especially when we live in a world that maybe doesn't have so many rocks or pillars anymore. People float from one thing to the other. This opportunity to think, wow, there's something that I can live for which is bigger than myself, that strikes to the heart of a lot of people. And as it should, because God created us for himself, and as Augustine said, we're, we're not at peace until uh, we're not at, um, at peace until we rest in him. God created made us for him. So that's something in all the people. In the Catechism, uh, 2471, there's this little passage. Before Pilate, Christ proclaims that he's coming to the world to bear witness to the truth. And the Catechism said, the Christian is not to be ashamed and have testified to our Lord in situations that require witness to the faith. The Christian must profess it without equivocation. There's a few passages that go on in the Catechism talking on this idea of suffering and ultimately um, martyrdom. So that can be, I think it's a scary thought to think like, as Christians, are we ready, excuse me, to uh, to give our lives or give some aspect of some good for our faith? Uh, in Australia, currently, uh, you know, we don't have to sacrifice our life for faith. There are things we do have to sacrifice, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, two types of martyrdom, but we do have to sacrifice things, and I think that's the whole genesis even of the Knights of the Southern Cross coming out of this idea that, you know, men who were Catholic weren't being given a uh, a fair spin. So we'll gather together to unite, to create fraternity, to bond together, to help us to move forward in that way. So born out of born out of persecution in some way, really, um, which is interesting. This video, which I'll show in one second, it's in Italian because of Pope Francis, but these words at the bottom, I hope you can read them. The general gist is, is Pope Francis talking about how Christians have endured um, persecution. It's quite good, which is why I wanted to show it. So we'll see how we go. Uh, do you want to put that in? Oh, okay. Go mm -hmm. back and put that blaze up in the middle of this light up. Yeah, I tried that. Or just run the link. I'll run, the link. I'll run the link. Just be with no the problem. moment, everyone. Um, Le avverte chiaramente che l'annuncio del regno di Dio comporta sempre una opposizione. E usa anche un Let's just speak Italian, I'll be okay. Yeah. Just have to stop the presentation for a moment. <coughs> yeah, let's try. Le avverte chiaramente che l'annuncio del regno di Dio comporta sempre una opposizione. E usa anche un'espressione estrema. Sarete odiati, odiati da tutti a causa del mio nome. I cristiani amano, ma non sempre sono amati. Fin da subito Gesù ci mette davanti a questa realtà. In una misura più o meno forte, la confessione della fede avviene in un clima di ostilità. I cristiani sono dunque uomini e donne controcorrente. È normale, perché il mondo è segnato dal peccato, che si manifesta in varie forme di egoismo e di ingiustizia, 
chi segue Cristo cammina in direzione contraria non per spirito polemico ma per fedeltà alla logica del regno di Dio che è una logica di speranza che si traduce nello stile di vita basato sulle indicazioni di Gesù questa fedeltà allo stile di Gesù che è uno stile di speranza fino alla morte verrà chiamata dai primi cristiani con un nome bellissimo martirio che significa testimonianza c'erano tante altre possibilità offerte dal vocabolario lo si poteva chiamare eroismo annegazione sacrificio di sé e invece i cristiani della prima ora lo hanno chiamato con un nome che profuma di discepolato i martiri non vivono per sé, non combattono per affermare le proprie idee e accettano di dover morire solo per fedeltà al Vangelo. So, it pretty much enunciates sort of what we just spoke about, but it's the Pope, so we might as well show that. So when we think of martyrdom, just to, I guess, clarify it, in the strict sense, martyrdom is dying for faith and consciously dying for faith and accidentally dying for faith. That is martyrdom when you freely accept it as well. Uh, but we can speak of, and I think it's good for us to speak of it as well, um, red or white martyrdom in theology. Red martyrdom obviously being death through blood, uh, but white martyrdom. And that's, that's sacrifice of any and every type for faith. Where you might, you know, in the in the case of uh, the genesis of the knights, you might have lost a job because you were Catholic, or you had to give something up. Maybe you couldn't comply today with a particular government law or regulation or something because of your faith. This is white martyrdom in all sorts, and that comes down to how we live and how we choose to live our faith. So when a Christian endures suffering for the faith, I said this earlier, he testified to the meaning of that faith and suffering born out of faith, particularly martyrdom, obviously. Um, lends a very distinct credibility, which isn't born from mere words. Um, a few years ago, our head office is in Germany, so uh, we need to go to Germany, the directors, every so often. And when I was there, I went to um, Paris and I saw an event they hold there at the Church in Need called the Night of the Witnesses. It's very beautiful, it's very striking, and they do it once a year. It was in Notre Dame Cathedral, only a few months before it, it burnt down, actually. But in this Night of the Witnesses, the cathedral is full and there's some beautiful music and they carry in these banners of a small selection of the men and the women, priests, religious lady who had died, or who had been martyred very specifically in the 12 months previous. It was like sort of a roll call of our heroes basically. And it was, the whole event had a tone of glorious hopefulness really that, and joy that these were the heroes of our faith being sort of brought back from battle almost and it was uh it was very beautiful very moving you saw these faces of these men and women coming forward and people came forward and made their own gesture with a candle or a prayer or whatever but um this idea that when someone is uh, dying for faith the whole community the whole uh, of the christian body is energized so martyrdom this is just a quote from me it's not a profound martyrdom is a natural consequence of living the christian life and i think that's an important reality for all of us who are trying to seriously live the Christian life is to know that uh, we will be called in some way, in some shape, to struggle for faith. And that's not a bad thing. That's the reality of faith. And uh, we should be aware of that before we, um, before we get there. Um, this is the video we didn't line up, Andrew, the one I forgot. Oh, there you go. Perfect. This is not Natalia. This is, um, do you mind pausing one second? I'm sorry, you're doing a great job, thank you. Um, this is a, I'll just preface it. 
I'm now moving, I suppose, to show just one video of, um, I guess, the situation that occurred in um, the Middle East. One of the reports we put out is called um, Persecuted and Forgotten. Uh, it's just an update of what's happening with Christian persecution across the world. And um, this was a story of, I guess, what was going on over there. Thanks. Elias was bound hand and foot to a cross. He was one of the Christians living in Raqqa, Syria, when it was seized by the extremist group known as the Esh, or ISIS. The extremists seized him after he could not pay the Islamic jizya tax that the Esh imposed on the city's Christians. He remained tied to the cross in solitary confinement for a month. And then things got worse. Daesh told him that his throat would be slit. A bomb blast devastated the complex where he was held. Elias was able to escape and, finding his wife, fled with her to Aleppo. In Aleppo they were cared for by aid to the Church in Needs project partners in the city. Elias is just one of the many Christians around the world who are suffering because of their faith. Christians whose stories have been uncovered by ACN's on-the-ground research for its persecuted and forgotten report, which has been backed up by other research. Persecuted and Forgotten examines the oppression of Christians between mid-2015 and mid-2017, focusing on 13 countries which are essential for any understanding of the trends in Christian persecution today. ACN's research revealed evidence of the most serious persecution against Christians in terms of violations of fundamental human rights, including violence, rape, unlawful detention, unfair trial, and prevention of religious assembly. In terms of the numbers of people involved, the gravity of the crimes committed and their impact, it is clear that the persecution of Christians today is worse than at any time in history. Not only are Christians more persecuted than any other faith group, but ever-increasing numbers are experiencing the very worst forms of persecution. In Syria and Iraq, we have seen an exodus of Christians from the region. The exodus is associated not only with conflict, but with the action of extremist groups. In Iraq, Daesh's plan to erase all evidence of the Christian presence was made plain. They desecrated or removed crosses and other symbols on church buildings. They defaced icons. They burned down churches and Christian homes. And they subjected Christians to denigrating treatment. One Christian woman described how the extremists took her and her baby to an internment camp where she was repeatedly raped. Elderly Christian woman Zarefa was one of the few Christians who remained in Karakosh when it was seized by Daesh. She remained there to nurse her dying husband. When Daesh's extremists raided her house, they found a crucifix and forced her to spit on the cross. And Daesh's campaign spread to Egypt, where a church which had already suffered ongoing persecution has now faced mass killings on repeated occasions. Such problems have also been seen in parts of Africa, for example in Nigeria, where Boko Haram's war on Christians has seen 1.8 million people displaced, more than 200 churches and chapels damaged, and its murderous campaign has left 15,000 children as orphans. But the Middle East and Africa are not alone in suffering persecution, nor is the problem confined to radical Islamism. In India, the rise to power of the right-wing BJP has made radical groups feel that they are free to attack Christians and other non-Hindu groups. From January to May 2017, there were 316 attacks on Christians, almost as many as were recorded for the whole of 2016. In Pakistan, Christians living under the threat of the controversial blasphemy laws have been raped, murdered, and the target of extremist bombings. 
in totalitarian regimes China and North Korea. Intolerance has risen as Christianity is perceived as a foreign influence that could undermine communism. The pulling down of crosses from churches in China is just the tip of the iceberg and churches are experiencing a renewed crackdown on church leaders considered dissidents by the regime. But there are signs of hope. In many of these countries, aid to the church in need has only been able to gain access to such sensitive information as it is already working alongside local churches, providing essential help and assistance. In Iraq, ACN is helping churches to rebuild Christian settlements that have been destroyed. It is helping Christians resume their lives in Iraq. As ACN's founder, Father Werenfred said, we are helping to dry the tears of the abandoned Jesus on the crosses of this century. That was a report, a video from the previous persecutor forgotten has been a number since, but I just thought that was a good summary because for many of us that's not a reality that we have or we would know of. It doesn't really get turned the ABC here. Uh, so in history, more than 70 million Christians have been martyred in the course of history. Half were martyred last century under communist and fascist governments. In the 21st century, this century, about 100 to 160,000 Christians have been killed each year. And again, this is not just accidental killing of people that were Christian, but the killing of Christians. And then roughly a million Christians are martyred worldwide between 2000 and 2010. Modern Christian statistics each month, 322 Christians are killed for their faith, 214 churches destroyed, 720, 772 forms of violence are committed. Um, more than 200 million Christians in the 50 countries it's most difficult to be Christian experience high levels of persecution. That's one in 12 Christians in some of the most dangerous countries for Christians, like in North Korea. Um, believers risk in immediate imprisonment through the torture and death. So there's a world watch list uh, which shows, you know, each year classifies the Christian uh, persecution area at the top of Afghanistan, which is taken over North Korea after 20 years, Somalia, and Libya. A lot of African nations, and you can see um, some of the usual suspects. But for a lot of these Christians, life is not how we have it. They leave it through a continual uh, lens of persecution. So that's the reality for a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ that behoves us to ask the question, how do we respond? And how does the church respond? Um, so I want to move, how much time do I have now? 10 minutes, 15 minutes? A bit more time? About 10. Great, all right. So I want to take, take a genesis from basically the idea that Christians are suffering into, I think I should talk about what age the church in need does. And that's my answer to the second question, how does the church respond? Um, it responds to uh, organisation, uh, like age of the church in need. I represent the Australian office. There are 23 offices of age of the church in need uh, around the world. Get offices in Germany, as I, as I said. Um, I like to point out the differences because I think for most people, uh, there's not a clear distinction in their mind between the Catholic charities and they're just all doing the same stuff. So just very quickly, you might have read ahead of it for me, which is fine. Catholic mission, its work in essence, let me break it right down, is to form people for mission and to raise funds for mission activity. Mission activity in its classical sense is taking the gospel to those who have not heard it. So it's evangelizing, strictly taking the gospel out of it. That's what mission, Catholic mission does. That's the Australian version of Pontifical Mission Societies, which is the, the Holy Father's um, charities. Caritas, which is the largest of all three. Uh, Catholic mission aids to do about the same side. Caritas is um, a Catholic relief organization. Its job, you can say, is the church going out to the world, any creed, any country, any color, when someone suffered humanitarian disaster in need of major relief, floods, cyclones, uh, that sort of thing. So it's a humanitarian charity, one of the largest ones. That's the church. So this is the church evangelizing. This is the church offering relief to all people. A to the church in need, uh, in its simplest form, I think, is the church going out to the church where the church can no longer look after herself. 
so it's a pastoral and spiritual charity. It's not a humanitarian charity like Caritas. It's there is some crossover in its work with Catholic Mission. They they have some nuns they support. We support some nuns. They support some seminaries. The difference I would say is that ACN, Age for Church in Need, looks through the lens of its work uh, through this idea of keeping the faith alive. So during the situation in with ISIS in the Middle East, we were rebuilding some homes, bringing Christians back. And so you could say, well, that's a humanitarian sort of work. And that is true. And we provide food to those families as well. But the reason we did it was a slightly different, was a very different reason to other charities. The reason we did that was because we wanted to maintain the Christian presence in the Middle East. And obviously, you know, to help those people. But our mandate is the keeping of the faith alive uh, in a pastoral and spiritual way. Um, so you've probably read all that now. So that's the difference. Maybe that's helpful to you, but at least uh, they're the three international Catholic charities. ACN has been a pontifical foundation since 2011 raised up by Pope Benny to that status. Uh, the reason was really that uh, it was run by our founder for 60 years. He died in 2003. And after he'd had some of the hell for 60 years, it was very difficult ACM was finding to get the right leader. And it was starting to topple and Pope Benedict stepped in and he said, uh, I don't want the church to lose um, another Catholic institution. So he essentially... Um, Refounded in his own name, which is why it's a pontifical foundation today, doing the work that's always done, but it is a paper charity. Um, oh, this is just an example. So you, you you may have heard of the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy. Most people know the corporal works of mercy, feeding the hungry, giving the drink to the thirsty, uh, sheltering homes, very good works. Most people out on the street, as in just the general society, Understand the corporal works of mercy. Makes sense. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked. ACN's work, I suppose, to a degree, is the spiritual works of mercy. We want people to grow in their faith. So what we're doing is trying to build up the life of the church by doing some of those things that are classed as a spiritual work of mercy. Incidentally, aid to the church in need uh, is classed by the Australian government as a, what's called a basic religious charity. That's an official name, basic religious charity. Um, we're the only Catholic we're the only large Catholic basic religious charity there is. We may be the only one that's not a parish or it's a church. Uh, and the reason is because we're classed as uh, doing the work of advancing religion. So we can't give taxes up to building. We're fully a registered charity, but, and we use that as a bit of badge of honor because we say we don't have to jump through the bureaucratic hoops. We don't have, owe anything to any government. We just do the work we have to do. And if all, if all Catholic institutions lost, lost tax deductibility, which will probably happen one day, it doesn't really make a difference to us because we've never been involved in it anyway. So we just, get on with the job of supporting suffering Christians. So we don't take any public money. We don't take any money from the church, the, the hierarchical church. Uh, we have 350,000 benefactors around the world. And those benefactors um, raise uh, around $200 million a year to execute five, five and a half thousand projects for the suffering church. So I for Genetic and International Catholic Charity, the birth, I said that dedicated support for suffering Christians. That's who we are. Um, I for Church Need has a, I think it's an interesting history. It began after World War II, and the, uh, the founder, uh, Baron Fried van Straten, a Belgian uh, Norbertine priest, he was asked to go and help the German Christians who had been, the German Catholics, I should specify, who had been ostracized after the war. Obviously, no one liked any German after the war, but the German Catholics had been pushed into some of the Protestant parts of Germany, so they had no pastoral care. The priests had been ostracized themselves. They really had no food, no transport, barely to clothes on their back. So he stepped in to support um, the German Catholics. And one of the first works was the establishment of these chapel trucks. And they drove around Germany for the best part of 20 years, right up to the late 60s, 69, I think was the last year. And they would drive around through the abandoned church of the open field and celebrate mass, baptize babies, marry people, bring uh, material aid that would be driven by a couple of priests. And they went out in these uh, these circles around doing that sort of work. And this was one of the priests, Father Thomas Tiding. He was offering mass on the side of this uh, chapel truck in a field somewhere. So this was a very unique sort of work. And there are people today who've said to me, uh, who've come from Germany and remembered uh, these chapel trucks driving around up to the late 60s, which is, um, which is fantastic. And then another one, this is our headquarters. It's been headquarters since, um, since the beginning of ACN. Uh, but then there were these vehicles for God that uh, Father Berenfried began at the same time as the chapel truck, giving these priests 
uh, the opportunity to minister to their people. They were driving, they were walking, I should say, 100 kilometers a week, ministering to the towns along the way and walking back. So Brother Verifid said, uh, Jesus doesn't need a donkey now as he did in Jerusalem, but he needs a Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these, these uh, vehicles for God were established and put around the place. Uh, and I guess it was a creative beginning to the work of ACN, and ACN uh, still, I think, exercises a sort of creativity in the way we do the work we do. And it's basically we're doing anything we can to help keep the faith alive, to keep the flame of faith burning. And there's one last video I promise I'll show you, which is the one we did line up, Andrew, mm -hmm. uh, with these kids at the front. It's our mission video. It's just a, it's always nice if sometimes it's a video with nice music that have me grab it on. So this is the video of who we are. Thank you, that For Christians around the world, it is becoming increasingly difficult to practice and live out their faith. In many places, our brothers and sisters suffer for their love of Christ. The mission of Aid to the Church in Need is to build a bridge of love that enables the suffering and persecuted church to witness their faith and inspire those who help them. Everything began on Christmas Day, 1947, when a 34 years old Dutch priest, Father Varenfried von Straten, moved by the material and spiritual poverty of 14 million Germans displaced after the war, called on Catholics in Belgium and Holland to help. The plea of this beggar of God released a flood of generosity, proving reconciliation between former enemies was possible. The success of this appeal later enabled him to turn to the needs of Christians suffering severe persecution behind the Iron Curtain. Today, Aid to the Church in Need, or ACN, is a pontifical foundation with an ever-growing international scope, 23 national offices around the world, supporting more than 5,000 project requests annually in over 145 countries. Through these projects, ACN supports the church in her service of prayer and action to hundreds of millions of people, providing not only a timely response to urgent needs, but also a sign of solidarity with our suffering brothers and sisters in Christ. Nowadays, a huge amount of this help is needed in the Middle East, where the Christian presence is facing an existential threat. The persecution initiated by fundamentalist groups has provoked an unprecedented exodus. ACN is committed to helping these displaced Christians by providing concrete answers to the strong hope and faith that they keep in the middle of this devastating situation. There and throughout the whole world, ACN helps the construction and reconstruction of church buildings, houses of God worthy of the sacramental life, and where Catholic communities gather to worship, pray, and be strengthened in faith. In fulfilling this work, an essential part of ACN's mission is to inform about this hidden suffering of Catholics in the world. ACN produces and distributes internationally two comprehensive publications, the Religious Freedom in the World Report, an analysis addressing the threat to religious liberty in 196 countries, and the Persecuted and Forgotten Report, an assessment and classification of those countries where Christians are persecuted and oppressed for their faith. In the face of this world, weighed down by unspeakable suffering, one of the most important needs is prayer. ACN supports contemplative sisters, allowing them to open with their prayer for humanity, a powerful wellspring of God's love. Particularly in isolated areas, the active sisters are who take care of those in spiritual or material need. ACN supports more than 12,000 religious sisters each year, helping them fulfill their vocation. ACN also contributes to those priests who keep the faith alive in their communities, but yet live in poverty. Annually, 43,000 of them receive mass stipends from ACN's benefactors who request Eucharistic celebrations for their intentions. 
These testimonies inspire courageous young men to offer their lives to serve the church. But in poor areas, answering this call is a difficult journey. To alleviate this need, every year ACN supports the formation of approximately 13,000 of these future priests worldwide. Where the faithful cannot go to the church, ACN helps the church go to the faithful by providing the necessary transportation for priests, religious sisters, and catechists to minister in the most remote areas. To help teach the gospel, ACN supports the translation, printing, and distribution of more than 51 million copies of the child's Bible in 190 different languages. For many, this colorfully illustrated catechism is the only book they will ever possess. Aid requests come not only for books, but for Catholic radio and television stations, as well as for the training of qualified staff who are supported by ACN to help spread the gospel in the media. The cross, the sign of God's promise, has guided the pastoral work of aid to the church in need. The vertical beam unites us to God's love and the horizontal beam in extending this love to our brothers and sisters. It is the cross that has also inspired ACN benefactors to help those who are unable to carry their crosses alone. They are being tested in faith. We are being tested in love. I picked up on that. I don't think I've got they've been tested in faith, we've been tested in love. This is a very famous quote from our founder. Um, and I asked the question here more than that myself on that what does our faith mean to us? Um, that's what this sort of I think interaction with the suffering church does to us. It asks us to wonder what does it mean to be a Christian to me? Because for most of us, it's easy excluding COVID, to get to Mass on a Sunday or go to confession or go down to the church to pray or, or engage in our faith, it makes us well, well if, if it's so easy for me, do I take the value I should? Do I evangelize the value I should? Do I live with the penitence I should? So what it makes me, I think that when our benefactors support us in whatever way they do, not just financially, but even spiritually, our love for these, these people who need help builds their faith, but it nurtures our own. And I think that's a big thing we see is that when we're going out to support our brothers and sisters in faith, our own faith is built up. Um, the well-being of families is going up the moment in Rome, incidentally. That's why it says that at the top. But John Paul said, as the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the whole world in which we live. I think it's a very good quote. But I think you could also say at the beginning, as the faith goes, so goes the family, so goes the nation, so goes the whole world. So the idea that we support brothers and sisters who are suffering builds our faith, builds the faith of hopefully our parishes, our communities, the life of the church where it is not suffering in the same way, which builds family, which builds the nation. Uh, and I know that the principal objectives of the KFC, which were really very good, the second one to foster this Christian way of life, I don't want to the other way, because in fostering the Christian way of life throughout the nation, you're promoting the advancement of Australia. And so this idea of supporting the faith, supporting the family, changes the nation and world. And I'm saying that I think it's connected to the way we understand our faith and we live that out. So I commend you on you know being a member of such a fine organization um, that is involved very on the heart of saying, well, you know, how do we grow in this faith ourselves as brothers? But how do we grow that? Uh, in whatever spheres of life we exist in. Um, as ACN, how do we want to engage people? Just so you knew, we use these three words, prayer, sharing, action. Obviously, praying for the suffragettes, it's a big part of what we do, being a spiritual path or foundation. We want prayer. We ask people to engage in prayer. We try and share what we do with the national office. I don't make any project decisions. We basically tell the stories of suffering Christians, invite people to join us on the journey, and that's always the best thing we can do. And we invite people to act most commonly uh, in our modern world, that's uh, that's monetary donations, but it's not always people very creative. One man I know just comes to mind. I think he lives in this state, actually. Every year he uh, takes his first uh, crop of grains and he sells it and he sends us the receipt of sale 
And that's his, I suppose, his first fruits offering to the work of the suffering church. So people are very creative. It's very beautiful to see. Uh, what about you? I think it's always good to make a call to action. Um, you know, you're involved in the life of the church in some way. If you want, if you feel moved to do that more, I'd say, you know, become a parish representative, volunteer, I can't pay you anything. But it's about becoming, I guess, a conduit between us and the local parish, doing whatever it is you want to do. Some people just stock the brochures. They make sure there's brochures in the parish rack. Obviously, you've let Father know, and he's okay with this role as a formality. But then people do all sorts of other things as well, because to have conduits on the ground, there's 1,300 parishes in this country. Uh, we operate out of one office. We're always looking for people to help us journey and share the word. So you'll find us if you want to, uh, and if you can ask for me, I'll do that. So I guess in a nutshell, Christians will suffer for the faith, many will die. Their witness should inspire our faith. Um, and baptizes one into the same body of Christ. We have to support with prayer and action the suffering church. I think it's good for the suffering church, good for the state of our church here. Um, I invite you later on in your break to take a mirror, because whatever you don't take will be recycled, which is fine. But take a mirror report as you want. I thought I'd bring it because. You are men who are obviously engaged. They are engaging, of course, about the work of our, our operation in many countries. Brochures are very simple for the average uh, Joe in the pews. So you can take those. We've got an appeal for Ukraine going, and um, you can read about that there. Uh, great to meet you. Thank you. I don't have any time for questions, but I hope that's been of some uh, help or enlightenment about what we do, but more specifically, uh, the plight of our, our brethren in faith around the world. So thank you for what you do. I think we might have time for a few questions of Bert. Do we have any questions from Paul or any from our um, interstate no, or if you have country questions or uh does anyone on Zoom have any questions? Oh, there you are. <clears throat> Um, yes. My wife and I've been supporting the aids of the church in them for a few years now. Bless you. And there's, I might have made the suggestion before, but we also support an organization called Barnabas Fund, which is also which is more of a Protestant type yeah. doing the same work. And what I find helpful, they have a daily prayer book where you, where you can pray for a different part of the world with Christians. You can pray for a Christian for a different part of the world with day to day week. Persecuted, and I'm wondering if aid to the church in need is interested in doing well, something like that because that might not get you all. Um, day yes. day day. It's funny you should say that because I don't know. Do you get our mail? Yeah, we do. Oh, you do. Well, as of this year, not quite a booklet, we've began a um, prayer points every quarter. Okay. So, uh, so, do you get a mail every month for us? Uh, could be every month, yeah. yeah. If you do, so we began that we, because we want to really encourage people to pray. So, every month now, now it's not a book of grants, the Barnabas Fund probably does a very nice book looking, but we have prayer points for every month of the year. And we say, you know, add these to your daily prayer because we want to do encourage people to think it's not obviously a charity needs money, everyone needs money, and that is that is true. But, um, but we very much it's a spiritual journey for people, and um. And we wanted people involved with that. So I like the book idea. We started the brochure and we got good feedback. And actually this year, for the first time, um, just incidentally, we sent a letter out to our, our benefactors saying we were arranging a uh, Gregorian, which is 30, 30 masses, consecutive masses for them. And I've never had so many letters of, you get a lot of letters, but there's so many letters thanking me for the Gregorian and they were uniting their own prayers. The master was offering, the priest was offering the master in that period. And I uh, invite them to bring their prayer petitions to us to write them on a piece of paper we sent. And uh, we gathered something like seven or 800 of these prayer petitions, bound them into a book and took them to the, um, the Tyburn sisters and presented these, these things to the sisters to pray. And just people are very grateful. My point to tell you that is because we really are trying to build a spiritual community, uh, not just um, have people's credit card numbers as well. So, yeah, so thank you. That's a good point. But as a matter of fact, our branch participated in that. Yes, Fantastic. down on North Branch, we uh, asked our members to put their prayer yeah, petitions in and sent them. Is it that it was 27 masses or something? 30, 30 masses. In 30 board, so yeah. so, but then we asked people to put their prayer intentions and send them to us as well. So, yeah. so what we did, we had our 30, we asked, we said the first 30 members of our branch who put in their petition 
the branch, oh, nice. the branch will pay for your retention. So some of our members can't contribute you financially, but we, we thank them for their support throughout the year. So we say, okay, well, this That's is something that branch can do for you. For example, my father-in-law had to undergo some serious uh, chemotherapy, not the, uh, they sort of like <clears throat> radiation treatment and other things last year, which I know was very difficult for it. So I put that as an intention. And that was one of the 30 intentions. So yeah, when, and that and that money, what I understand is goes to the pre yeah. it goes to priests overseas who offer that's for that intention. It was sort of listed in the video. So I see in the range of the last one, I think about two million masses for more priests, which is actually um I think it's about yeah, one in ten priests. One in ten priests are supported by mass offerings from AC and benefactors who make an offering like you would to the local parish priest and you offer mass or whatever. But um it's been a it's something people really feel attached to. They they have a they buy a car, they send it, you know, dear so and so we're having a mass offer your intentions. It's a beautiful spiritual gift and it supports the poor priest as well, uh, but also um brings to the poor the value of the mass. So yeah. Well, what, in your opinion, is the main driver of people to be persecuting Christians? Questions. Um, if there are different drivers, actually. So what happens in some African nations is different to what happens in Indian nations or in Pakistan. Some of them, some of Middle East is um, different, like you've got the situation different herdsmen or tribesmen or different political groups that just don't like Christians and will just push them. We've got a, there's a lot of situation in Africa where farmers of different groups will just attack one another and that they'll blow, blow up churches and burn churches down. I think classically they just do a broad brush stroke. It's not understanding the other, really, not understanding the other and not appreciating the other and disliking what you believe the other stands for ultimately. I mean, it's the... It's the classic thing of all sin, I suppose. It's just not wanting to, uh, um, not liking what that person is or what they represent. I don't know if all these people understand Christianity um, or if they, you know, just take it as what they've heard, but I think it's a misunderstanding ultimately. Or maybe, you know, they just don't like them. Oh, um, in some places, yes, because, you know, they do very well in the work they do, you know, and maybe the, Another religious community might feel uh, threatened by that. So yes, they would rise up against them. Um, it is different each place. It's sometimes political, sometimes it's circumstantial, sometimes it's a government, a whole government against them. Um, but every place is a bit different. But um, yeah, threatening would be one of them. So yeah. I think Dominic can respond. I was very surprised to hear that the Chris Kennedy's since are the most persecuted religions on earth. Uh, so it's very surprising because going by the media, we didn't think that at all. So what do you think, why do you think it is that in the media, we don't seem to get much of the news compared to some of the other Oh, well, I think everyone probably knows, I guess the media is not on the side of faith is secular. I don't know if there was a time when the, religion, when the media was very religious or favorable to religion, but it's secularized and you won't hear obviously much about it. You hear occasionally something, but nothing to any scope. I mean, even the, the Roe v. Wade overturning or, or changing in the US, you'll get one particular perspective. I think it's just a secularization of media, but also it, it's a very much a dislike, I think, and a hatred of Christianity by media. So we know that. And I think that's my point really is to say that I, maybe that's just my perspective, but I think we have to understand that Christians will suffer for faith. And that's been the story since the beginning. So to think we're going to sit around here today and solve up a 10 point plan is how to stop Christian suffering. I hate those ads that say, donate money and stop poverty. You're never going to stop poverty because our world suffers from original sin. We suffer from a lot of failings. And that's why I said, how does the church respond to persecution? And that's why I point to ACN because we want to be there at the foot of the cross. I'm not saying that ACN doesn't go to advocate those reports. We spoke about persecuting forgotten religious freedom in the world. I made international reports and they're tabled internationally and we try to do what we can to advocate. But I think for most people, and I think that's a great Christian tradition, is we sit at the cross where people suffer and some are called to do more, but a lot aren't. So I think we want to present ways to support those who are suffering now 
Um, and that's what we try and do. But, you know, there's a very secular bias. I'd say hateful media there, and that's what we all see. So, Thank you, Ben. Uh, well, I'll now ask uh, Slate to answer the Paul Mitchell to come and give a vote of thanks to our speaker. Thank you, Bernard. I did take some notes, but I think it might take uh, another half an hour for me to uh, go through them all. Um, I'm a notorious note taker, but I did uh, I did respect and understand ACN much better as a result of Bernard being with us today. And, uh, and I want to congratulate him on the uh, of being prepared to come down and speak to us um, as a body and then fly back to Sydney. That was uh, an effort that we uh, we welcomed and we're very appreciative of. And uh, we certainly have learned a lot. And I want to thank you very much for uh, being with us today and sharing it, obviously, from the heart. And uh, we, we do have a... Uh, a little presentation to, uh, to pass on to you before you before you leave. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. Now, I invite Carmen Miranda to speak about the Audit Development Committee, and we'll take questions from members after uh, Carmen's presentation. So, Chairman, Bob Tony, lots of honour, life members, state councillors, Dollar Rubbers, once again. Um, when I uh, finished my time as the state chairman, I didn't think I'd. Uh, be uh, handed any more uh, uh, chairmanships, but uh, uh, I um, don't know. I must have uh, been the only one standing, standing still. Everybody uh, took one step back because I became the uh, audit development uh, chairman. So uh, the ones that know me probably uh, uh, know that I'm not into vision and mission, vision statements and things of that nature. But uh, I've been working with John Hennessy now for some probably five years, and I think it's starting to hit home that uh, we need to have these things. And one of the biggest things that uh, we, as a committee, um, worked on, it took us a long time too, to, to get it right, um, but we finally put together a vision statement for the Audit Development Committee. And I want everyone to be aware of what our mission vision statement is. So our vision statement is, the Audit Development Committee to be the training body that enables members to grow their knowledge and skills for the ongoing future of the order. Um, that took uh, three one-hour sessions to finally come to that um, mission statement. Uh, and, you know, I'm proud that we've finally been able to come together as a group and agree to... Uh, a vision statement for the ongoing future of the order. The mission statement was a bit easier. We didn't uh, have as many uh, uh, chewing and problem with that, but uh, the, mission, the mission statement is to educate members at all levels in how successful organisations are managed and how they use this knowledge to play a significant role in the future of the order. So, they're now bedded down and uh, they do need to be reviewed on a regular basis, which is probably once a year. But uh, um, I can say that uh, I'm wrapped and finally uh, put those things to bed for 12 months at least. Um, and, you know, I joke around about that, but uh, I think branches really need to look at doing those things themselves uh, for the success of the order going forward. Now, this is probably more up my alley was uh, I did set aims 
for the ODC committee. Um, and one of the one of the aims, and to me, an aim, a vision is the same, but my OAL aims were to assist in training and upskilling of our membership. Um, and ensure that all branches know what the order have available. Um, the resources we've got, because there is plenty. And I don't believe that members know what we have available. And I want all branches to come to us or any of our, my members on the committee, um, just to make themselves aware of what we do have available. Now, we've got the order development manual, or order training manual, um, which over, over the last 12 months, I know when, whenever we've got up, we've sort of tried to push that, but it's now at a stage where it's easy to read, easy to use. Um, we've got, uh, what's the word, Glenn? No, you, uh, how you, huh? I've got lots of links, but also it's a very easy to read. So if you are in any specific area, you look at the index and you can actually uh, go directly to what we, what we really do. Uh, or what you, you're looking for. Now we started the year with we we set out to do hold four workshops or training days um, throughout Victoria. Uh, we've revised that to three because uh, we held one in Bacchus Marsh. Um, that was for the District Eleven, which makes up six branches plus the Essendon Kilo. Uh, we did that our first one in February, and uh, from all reports and the feedback we got, it went down uh, tremendous. And from that, it gave us plenty of enthusiasm to uh, continue with the workshops. And uh, that, that one in February uh, was hosted by Bacchus Marsh, and we had about 22 in attendance. Um, now, in the Crusade, you'll seen a beautiful photo with, uh, I think there was, uh, might have only been 20 in that photo of the few had to head off, you the speakers had to head off, but it, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it gave me plenty of enthusiasm in the committee to uh, know we're going, going down the right direction. Uh, then we planned the one for May uh, in Box Hill. That, that was going to be a little bit different than what we'd planned for in Bacchus Marsh. Um, it was probably the first one we had probably younger members or newer members to the order. Whereas the one in Box Hill, we were talking to people who've been members for a very long time. And they could probably teach me a lot more things than I could teach them. But uh, what we wanted to do with them is really get a, a bit of a, a feedback on what, how they felt that we could help them as branches. And I was, I was amazed and the committee was amazed at how well that actually did go. Um, I think we had about 18 in attendance that day. Um, and that was from three three uh, districts um, plus the Canberra South Branch. And initially we were planning on doing one for Oakley and uh, Daniel North, um, and then a third, a fourth one for Ben Tobin. We decided now because uh, uh, we're looking at now doing training days, it would have probably got, we wouldn't have had enough days available to do it. So, we're actually doing the third walk workshop is going to be Mentone, I'm sorry, yeah, District 11. It'll be hosted by Mentone for District 8 and 9. Um, which takes up a fair, 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 fair few branches as well. And that's planned for September. I think mm -hmm. it's going to coincide so it doesn't affect any football. It'll be uh, on the Sunday um, for really the final weekend. So everybody will be able to get there, no excuses. Um, so the first part of the operation was the workshops, and I think that we've got them down pat now. Um, the next thing is the training days. What probably really people, their members want to hear on where we can help um, branches. And there's been a lot of work done by Brother Michael, Brother John, and probably Brother Glenn in looking at putting together <laughs> modules, which will allow us to pick a particular thing that you've got interest in, um, be it membership, uh, be it uh, projects, or be it planning, um, and you just go, you can go to the module. Once you've probably done the training course, we don't expect you just to go to these modules beforehand. You've got to come to the training days, so we know how to use them correctly, and then, then you've got the modules available. But 
I'm not going to go into the modules today, but there are nine modules. So we're probably going to run three um, training days for the areas. Uh, the areas. Um, this will be too much to do all nine on the one day. But just a just an overview. Uh, the nine are recruitment and retention of members. Number one, uh, the plan where we plan and organise. That's where the visions and mission um, and who we're going to target uh, will be involved. Three, uh, what the church is actually calling laymen groups to do. Um, four, prioritise the. The the, uh, uh, the list, well, at the end of the day, most, most groups or parishes will have a list of items. Then we've got to categorize the most important ones and the things, the ones that we can uh, probably assist or pull portfolios for. Uh, the fifth one is the right man for the right job. So at the end of the day, we might have a project coming up and we, we're looking for specific people that can actually run that particular project. Uh, reporting, um, I'm sure that. Uh, Probably it'll uh, give us more an update on that. But at the end of the day, for reporting, we all have plans, but we don't seem to report to the plans, right? Uh, we know we, we've put things together, but we don't sort of give a running commentary on how we're progressing with these plans. Um, reporting will be a, a session. Successful branches um, will be another one. Uh, recruitment campaigns uh, and the ultimate out outcomes. Um, uh, for at all levels. So they're the nine modules. Um, the first four uh, are pretty much down pat. So we're going to start with them and start doing a bit of a roadshow the branches that have already partaken in the uh, workshops. But as well as those training things, we've also, uh, with the OBC, we've been involved in um, initiative, other initiatives. Public speaking, it's been some probably 10 years since we've had a public speaking course. I still recall the course I was involved with, with uh, 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 brother uh, Tom Petrie ran and uh, uh, brother Tony, myself and a few members from North Daniel were involved in that. And then from doing the course, we, uh, brother Tom encouraged us to help him out and uh, we thought it was fantastic. And uh, that's more by the wayside, but, uh, this year, Chris Young, that was a member on our committee, felt that yeah, we really need to get back into it. And so, um, our first one will, has been penciled in for term three, which I think is starts in two weeks' time, or three weeks' time, three weeks. and it'll run for 10 weeks. Um, the first course will be run at Nazareth College. At this point in time, we've got four students from the campus that have put up their hand and uh, happy to do the course. We'd like to have at least 10 in attendance and we you know so if anybody has got any children or anybody that would like to be involved in a public speaking course um you've got two weeks to let us know you said that uh, we'd like to get about 10 in attendance for our first one and, and then i don't think that'll be the only one we'll hold this year but we're hoping that branches will come to us and say listen uh, we've spoken to a couple of schools and they're interested in running some courses and we'll, we'll we'll be happy to help you out with those we'll appoint uh, a trainer for the course and then uh, we would hope that the branch has given us um the nomination will also assist them you know providing coffee and tea on on the day that's chosen uh, but our starts in three weeks so if you're aware of anybody that all was anybody here would like to partake in the course come and see us at the end of the day and uh, um is this room okay? Uh, the instructor's manual and the uh, uh, the student's manual have all been updated, and uh, so if anybody would like to have, have a look at those and have a copy of those, let us know. We'll be happy to uh, pass them on as well. At the moment, uh, brother John Smart that spoke before, he's going to be the head instructor, um, and we've got a couple of uh, assistants. I think uh, brother Michael's uh, put up his hand to assist, um, but you know. We're after, as well as having uh, the courses, we'd like to have people put up their hands, especially if we've got teaching experience, to make life a bit easier for everybody. You've heard, uh, I'm spewing that uh, Brother John's not here, but Brother John Smith has uh, given me plenty of enthusiasm being a Knights uh, member. 
you know, he's a fairly young fellow. He's probably about 40 years of age. He's got four kids. Um, and he's a pretty, he's very busy. But he came to our branch and gave us some ideas on the Golden Beer. And uh, from that, I put a forward to uh, uh, the ODC. And he's got he's got a lot of contacts. So something he didn't really push himself. So any branch would love to uh, have guest speakers. He's got access to guest speakers, right? And uh, uh, take advantage of them because they're, they're, all, they're, they're all names that uh, people are aware of. And uh, um, I know at the moment we're doing the Golden Beer Nights. Um, so first, the second Monday of the month at the night, some people say it's too far away, that's fine. If you'd like to, to come closer to your branches, let us know and we will organise one in your area, okay? With our support, and we'll be there as well. So there's been three held face to face this year, and of the three held, the numbers have been 50, 110, and 60. Excellent. And it's a good mixture of people, young, old, males, and females. Um, like, on to, finish, to finish off, I can, the, the, the committee initially started 10 members at the start of the year, where officially, the, and I, I say officially because I don't think the ones that really come regularly, we came to six members. And, and a lot of them are state councillors. So we're really after people that aren't state councillors that would like to help out and come with some fresh ideas. At the moment, we've got Brother Michael, Brother Andrew, Brother Glenn, Brother John, myself, and Brother Neil. So they're, they're the six official uh, members. I know we've got 10 on the list, but uh, I've had a few uh, um, that have handed in their resignation and a few that, um, uh, you know, they don't feel like they're able to put the time in, so that's fine. But we're after new blood, so if anybody would love to help, um, come and tap us on the shoulder. I'm only here for another hour, so uh, uh, the more month, the more members on the committee will just uh, share the load, and because we're here to help everybody here, right? It's it's a group. It's the OBC is here to improve everybody's skills um, and to make sure you're aware of everything we've got available. Do we have any questions for Brother Karma? Okay. Training, yes. Can we get some by Zoom or whatever? Uh, look, I think it's too hard to look by Zoom. But you can walk in if you want to see our special class. First one you make by Zoom. Oh, whatever. Are you talking about the course it's itself? The training, the training course itself. It, can that be? We're, we're going to aim to film it yeah. and then. Try and make that available. Okay, thanks. So we're going to aim to make sure that uh, the school allows us to do that. The school allows us to do it. We'd yeah. like to be happy to do that as well. But uh, I was hoping that uh, I couldn't see the course being done by Zoom uh, because it'd be too hard. You know, I think. But uh, I think it's a face-to-face -face thing for it to work properly. Are there any other questions from right now? We've got a little bit of time to make up. I'll call now uh, Brother Glenn Morris to speak about the Governance Committee. Good afternoon, everyone. Like the morning session, the aims of this particular presentation is to how and why the governance what the objectives of the committee are, a little bit about the committee, what some of the outcomes are, and once again, more requests. I'll master this one, don't you? So the background is, it was the responses to the um, the survey that indicated that we needed further governance within the order. So what is governance? You did ask for it, but it's about the big picture. It's all the practices, processes and policies that guide our order in the right direction. Broad statement, what does it mean? Processes that reflect 
best practice. Effective planning and reporting systems. Defined roles, responsibilities and authorities. A risk management system. And finally, recognition and rewards for our members. And Brother Carmen's already spoken about reporting. So it's a pet subject that I have that we don't know what's going on unless we report if we're planning how we're going with our plans. But also with the governance committee, we look at are we got the right tools of trade? Our documentation, is it correct? So I don't know if you can see the pictures, but it actually reflects probably quite accurately where we were in the order that we were trying to manage with equipment that was far out of date and had to be upgraded. And also our documentation system needs to be more controlled. So that's all works in progress. I think we've started at least giving the people that needed the tools of trade. We also need the decision making authorities in the right place. So the people in different roles have the appropriate authorities, and that needs to be documented. Oh, now that didn't quite work. So quite often, yeah, you might have a vision and you think you're going to go straight to the end state and what you actually end up with is not quite what you probably envisaged in the first place. So what went wrong? We go back to what Brother Carmen's been talking about, what Brother John Hennessy has been talking about for a long time. You've got to promote sound planning processes. And the audit development committee will be running training sessions covering literally that subject. Okay. Now, I don't know if you can see that too clearly from the back, but there's a gentleman standing just there. So we've now got the right outcome. Is it, is it safe? I can tell you that that gentleman did actually get killed, that very one. But he developed a risk appetite which was far exceeding the circumstances he was working in. He just got very complacent. So we have to include risk management in all our projects. Quite often, this very simple exercise. You might just need a couple of controls in place, but it will make your project work better. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So, the governance committee are not a standalone police committee or anything. We report and provide recommendations to state council. We provide guidance and advice to the other committees. We facilitate risk assessments and review all the procedures, documentation and facilities. So each of those areas need constant review. The government's committee, unlike most of the other committees, we don't meet regularly. We don't say we meet once a month or the likes. We just meet as required. We respond to requests from the other committees, and that's usually what wakes us up. But we do do an ongoing monitoring of ordinance of order governance issues. Finally. Like all the other commissions, we're looking for volunteers to join. Do we have any questions for 
So the question about the governance risk. I'm just making a comment again. I'm just overawed with all the things that are happening, but I don't know if we're going to get the hang of how to do it. No one's getting the hang of it. Me, no, I'm right. So, but it is really good. And um, I'll bring that up. Fantastic. I'm going to make a comment. I brought the the lens committee was quite helpful for the communications committee recently because we had a request from the KSC pre support and education fund committee they wanted to start the Facebook page to advertise the archbishop's dinner and so our committee we had we discussed it at our meeting about what we thought so we thought might be some concerns and some procedures that need to be followed but we we requested the help of the government governance committee as well to and they did a risk assessment about some of the activities about the Facebook page and the result of the risk assessment was provided certain protocols were kept in place and um, then the, the Facebook page was an acceptable uh, activity to be done wouldn't uh, be a serious risk for the order so that was a, just an example we've had recently of Two committees working together, uh, the valuable input of uh, people on the governance com committee who had that risk assessment experience. Thank you. We'd like to just make that broader now. Uh, if you've got any questions, please help in that area. Please call. Does anybody on Zoom have any questions for Brother Glade? No. Doesn't appear to. I'm going to invite Brother John Bruce to speak about planning for the audience. That's right. Just let me get ready and tell me. Uh, So far today, you've heard about um, committees. The committees that we've heard about so far are faith and fraternity, church and clergy interaction, community communications, the ODC committee, and Glenn just spoke about the governance committee. There was one other committee. It was a social justice committee. One that I initially offered to take chairmanship of, but circumstances have prevented me from doing that. But we have identified a sixth committee, which is our planning committee. Who is on the planning committee? Our state chairman, Brother Paul Mitchell, Brother Glenn, and myself. I think we're fairly efficient. Carmen said it took him three meetings to uh, get a vision and a mission statement. It took us 10 minutes of one meeting to ratify one with a bit of work in between meetings. So, uh, Carmen, you've got to pick up your efficiency rate, mate. The strategic planning is a broad subject. It is we have a strategic plan already. In 2017, it was launched at our state conference. It was for five years. This year at our state conference, we will present the next strategic plan, the 2022-27 strategic plan. The committee has that as its primary aim this year. We have a work plan. That work plan is looked at at every meeting. Adjustments are made. Where we've achieved things, they're ticked off. That's the idea of a plan. In my professional career, I was involved in a number of strategic projects 
Like one, you look out the window here at Doncaster Hill. In the mid 1990s, just after the commissioners were decommissioned from councils, the, the council undertook to start planning that. In actual fact, Doncaster Hill is a generational plan. It was always going to take 30 to 40 years. It's changed as it goes along. I saw the same thing happen with South Bank. I saw the same thing happen with Docklands. And I've been fortunate enough to see the same thing happen with Docklands in London, where I've been a couple of times. I don't know whether anybody's been to London and seen Docklands there. But it's been an evolutionary process and it has kept the history of the docks. And I love Docklands. But how do we bring that back to what we're doing? And a little bit of geography here, because the Vasco da Gama Bridge in Lisbon is a great architectural bridge. And by the way, it has six pillars supporting it. I'm going to equate that picture and refer to it as I go through because of our six committees. Each of those supports supports the bridge. If one of them fails, the bridge will fail. That's the same with our committees. They have to be able to perform. Our the vision and mission statement that the planning committee developed. They are there. I don't know whether you can read them. I hope they're big enough. But they're the overarching vision and mission statements for the whole of the order, for all of the committees. And the committee's vision and mission statements must fit with those two. They're broad enough to be able to do that. And at branch level, where the branch develops a vision and a mission statement, they also have to fit with those two statements. We haven't yet developed a values statement or exactly <coughs> how we progress below that. That is a work in progress. As I said, if one of those piers underneath the bridge fail, <coughs> the roadway that is supporting will fail too. Our committees are important to us. Don't think of a bridge as just being a bridge. It's a journey. Because you start at one end, you finish at another end, and you keep going. And our committees are meant to be exactly the same as that. When we finish a project within that committee, it shouldn't just stop. There will be things come out of it. <laughs> And it's a matter of making those, whatever comes out of the outcomes, live. Living a project is important. Commitment to it is important. Can we run to the next slide, please, Andrew? A strategic plan requires a number of things, factors that are going to make it work, especially communication as we're developing the plan. And the planning committee is actually developing a communication plan so that we can both consult with state council, we'll state, consult with branch and district chairman, and we'll consult with branches. 
And the state councils have a, an important role in this because they have been allocated to branches. <clears throat> and we want them to give feedback to state council so that we can feed that into the strategic plan. Our big consultation process was the survey that we did in 2009, 2020, when we were in lockdown. It took a long time to analyze that, but the six committees actually came out of that process. If I label one word, it is process, because planning is a process. It's an evolving process, and I don't think that there are very many manuals, if any, that will cover every strategic planning project uh, and that is developing. Certainly didn't happen with Doncaster Hill. That was changed along the way, et cetera, et cetera. This particular slide, I tried to pull it all together. In the middle, of the star I have the bridge. The theme of this conference was change, challenge, and opportunity. Change. How often does change walk up to you and say, hello, Andrew, I'm change. That's not the way that change works. Change is happening and it's going to happen through the plenary council and the outcomes of it. Who in this room has read the December report from the plenary council and the outline that's come up? Four, five. How many have we got here? 40? There's another 35 that have to start reading them because to me, they're going to be that those two documents and what comes out of next weekend are going to be a future project for us. It's going to be a project that will embrace all of the order and our energy because if we don't fit with what the plenary council is saying, we can give up and go home. It's that important to me. And I think once you read it and see what's in it, you'll think the same way. When we see change and see it happening, I see something different to what Andrew sees. I see something different to what Brother Paul sees. So what do we do? We've got to talk about the change. And that's the process of talking about change. And it starts here today, even though we've been doing it for a long time. But from now on, we're going to start thinking about change. The challenge. The challenge is about putting the time and effort into working on the change. It might sound simple. But if you don't put the time and effort in, we won't get anything out of it. Opportunity. Opportunity only comes once. You take it when it's there or it's gone. It's gone, we've lost that opportunity. So we can't be backward in confronting change. But I come back to the change. And we have to be able to collectively recognize that it is change that we are seeing. And what one of the things Father Tony spoke about, and we've been practicing in State Council, is a little bit of time thinking about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. And being able to have an opportunity to recognize that the Holy Spirit can work with us. 
what we have been doing, I have found very powerful. It's, it's collectivism. And you can, when you start to talk about change and thinking about other things and the work of the Holy Spirit, if you have been involved with it and you come up to somebody who hasn't been, they just look at you dumb because they haven't experienced it. The trouble is that how do we get Father Tony out to everybody so that we can actually experience this? Experience feeling the work of the Holy Spirit, being able to reflect upon what we do and how we share that experience. In the committees, oh, I've gone too long. Um, we have to talk about how the committees work. Do they vote? I prefer to see them work on consensus. And the other thing is the, com the committees actually cooperating and collaborating. You put this slide together, that's the future of the committees in the Knights of the Southern Cross. They really have to work this way or one or two of these pillars under the bridge is going to collapse and we know what will happen then. That's it. Thank you. That doesn't say anything, but do we have any questions for John? Take a shot. Yeah, you mentioned enthusiastic about the Holy Spirit. I think it might be an idea when we're saying the prayer to the Holy Spirit to have a bit of a pause on instruct us in what we should do, inspire our suggestions. We say it every meeting, but we don't slow down and let the spirit. I agree with that. But the way Father Tony has been helping state council to invoke the Holy Spirit, the experience of the Holy Spirit is a little bit different. But I, I agree. Um, there are certain parts of our prayers that we can emphasize, and that's one. We now come to our open forum session. So here is an opportunity for our members, including those on teleconference, to bring up items uh, from the floor. So uh, do we have anyone who would like to bring up an It can be related to something that was discussed today, or it can be another topic. We've got, I think we have time for 15 minutes of open forum. So. Brother Peter, would you like to? Would you like to come to the front? Oh, I didn't think I'd like to touch. Maybe, maybe for the open forum, if we can get, if, if you want to speak, you can come to the front and introduce yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Your name Absolutely. and your Brother branch. No, I just wanted to put another question to Brother John Bruce on his planning. Um, we got half a dozen younger people here, people over the age of 70, and maybe over the age of about 55. And you got interface with the planning committee to those younger people. They, they're too busy to join your committee because they're doing things. But have you got an interface? I can't see why they can interact with us, but I would have to check that with the chairman of the committee. Brother Paul, look, I, I, I think that they could be like in as observers for um, uh, our Zoom meetings. Of course. Yes. No problem, Mother Peter, in exchanging that, that link. Uh, anybody's welcome to participate. Everything we decide is uh, passed back to State Council anyway. So, uh, yeah, that's an important suggestion. Uh, would you like to come to the podium? Yeah, 
Yes, Valencia, I think uh, this is for the benefit of the uh, members who are on teleconference. All right. I just wanted to take the opportunity because it's about four years now that I've been back in the order. And I had to go through a lot of pain with Brother John. But I think with what I've seen today, he should be a very happy man. It's all coming together. And if people get behind everything that's happened today, the order's got a future. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Uh, brother Michael. Yes, brother. Let me see. It's brother Kevin Pagan from the Keller branch on Zoom. Well, brother Kevin, you can't bring him up. Brother yes. Michael, uh, I'm having trouble with the sound. I don't know where the... We can hear you okay, Kevin. Can you hear us? You can't hear us. No, I don't know where the microphone is where you, from where you're standing. But it's right in front. The sound, is, the sound is very, the sound is very, very poor. Okay, how, how, does that help? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, better. Okay. okay. Um, go uh, hang on. I'll put that spotlight. Kevin, do you have a question? Do you have do you have a question, Kevin? No, no, brother Andrew, but the sound has been very, very poor for some from some of the speakers. Okay. So we're gonna hold them. No. Nah. Okay, do we have it? Is there anyone on teleconference who would like to uh, put forward a statement or contribute to the open forum? Now's your time. We might go well, going once, going twice, brother Paul. I think you're going to get an opportunity to speak at the end anyway. I'm just wondering how to the principal because the outside council and myself in the group are all here for your benefit. We're not here for our benefit. We want to hear what you would like to see. So uh, I just want to encourage a couple more uh, suggestions about whether or not um, what we've been talking about today is actually uh, something inspiring or whether we should forget about it. Now, we uh, may have all the opinions, but what I would encourage is to, to uh, express them publicly. So, uh, so I implore you to uh, take part while you have the time. Thank you. <laughs> Speak up, everyone, please, Brother John. Uh, well, so I think today's presentation has probably been the best I've ever attended in the last 20 years of coming to conferences. Um, it's been well coordinated and the new technology has helped. And I think the planning and the execution of some of these committees will be of benefit to the board in the long term. We also appreciate the uh, the attendance by teleconference. How many got twelve? Is it about five? About oh, five, is it? Yeah. yeah. And we we thank those members who. Uh, we appreciate the great distance that some people uh, attend by having to attend conferences by the country. And we're glad that you're able to participate in our seminar today uh, by teleconference. And hopefully it's been a good experience and you haven't been able, you have been able to follow the discussion pretty well. Unless there's any more questions for open forum, I'll invite to the, our brothers, Brian. I think, you know, a plan in the door is always very, very handy. And there's people in the room here who well understand what that means. Not always do you get the opportunity to play out. But I think the one thing that's happening here since the early stages of this process, when John Henderson sort of pushed the buttons and said, this is going to be different, 
is that it's continued to be built on. It doesn't always happen in five minutes, but the beauty is that it's it's been built on. It hasn't been reinvented by anyone else. It's just been built on, and it'll take time. But I congratulate you all who have been involved in that process, because if it's if it hadn't continued on as it started, then it would be lost again. An opportunity would have been lost again to the order. And as us older buggers are going out the door, at least this is an opportunity for the young ones to actually pick up something that's going to be really worthwhile for the Knights of the Southern Cross into the future. Thank you, Mark. Now, I'll now call on our state chairman, Brother Paul Mitchell. He will uh, provide a summary of the day. I think we're suddenly back on back on schedule. I think, Colin. Brother Paul. No. We fathers and brothers. What I would like to do just, just now is just to uh, refresh everybody's memory on uh, on what we've covered and uh, what you might be able to do with it. As I just said a moment ago, um, this annual seminar was uh, always conceived as a, a means of communicating with the membership, both uh, to learn what State Council are doing, uh, but also to regular input feedback uh, as to how we're proceeding. We started off today with very informative uh, a bit of information from Father Tony on uh, who we are with when we meet together and what uh, part of that community via the Plenary Council are, are putting together on our behalf. And uh, we ended up with a presentation by uh, Brother John, which pointed out how important where those decisions of the Plenary Council are going to be for State Council and the order as a whole. And nobody mentioned the fact, but the Knights of the Southern Cross is one of the, the few Catholic organisations specifically listed in the Plenary Council's deliberations. And we have an obligation to our members not to forget that we've been recognized in that way and we can make use of it. Then we came to uh, some explanations and uh, history about what members have been doing. And we heard from Brother Neil Daly, uh, Bernard Doherty, uh, and uh, John, about the activities that we are actually involved in and what they're, what they're doing for us and how they are <coughs> evolving into a modern day activity. They're not doing what was always done, they're doing something new. And one of those things that, that is new are the six committees of State Council. And we've spent a lot of time today conveying to you just exactly how important they are to your order. I'm quite sure you all know the importance of faith and fraternity. But to put it into context, we've got a specific uh, Councillor, who is a fraternity officer, 
and we've got a specific committee with off-state council members who are doing their utmost to convey and help with those objectives of building faith and encouraging fraternity. Communication, you heard how that was so vital to how we operate these days. Our communication is totally different to the way it was. And not everybody is familiar with the video screen or the microphone and how it works because we still have trouble but we want to make the maximum use of it some of the other committees you know church and clergy uh, we've been hearing for a long while about how difficult it is to uh, get in touch and uh, with our parish priests and, uh, and our clergy We've now got a committee that is uh, making us much more aware of how that can be uh, improved. So, uh, you know, the governance committee, state council has never had a governance committee before. What's governance all about? You know, who governs us? Well, in the past, we've been able to uh, employ excellent admin people run our office for us and the rest of us are all volunteers that do what we can when we can <clears throat> but we got to be moved beyond that and start governing ourselves and improving what we do and how we do it so there again it's all uh, it's all about improving even the training, the training modules that Brother Carmen mentioned are sort of the jobs that are fit for purpose in how we will help branches move forward, encourage new membership, create activities and vibrant works. So what will all these committees actually have a, uh, a very specific purpose. But they won't work without members. And one of the changes that has been made is that State Council now only has eight members. Previously, it had 12, 15, 20. But now we have eight, and all these committees need people willing to give up their time from outside state council. As Brother Carmen said, some of them have uh, extra members. Brother Andrew with his uh, church and clergy interaction has about 10 or 12 uh, people, all of whom are from outside state council. And we want the same to happen with all the other committees. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my committee of the planning committee has only got three. And that's because when I put an ad in the Crusader last, the last time around in May, uh, nobody put their hand up. And uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that today somebody said, well, why can't the younger members join in? Well, I welcome that. Uh, that's, the, that's how I became involved and uh, got tapped on the shoulder for this job. I attended the seminar and somebody from my branch said, Paul, I didn't know you were so interested. Well, that was the beginning of the end <laughs> because I started to get more involved. And I'm hopeful that some of these younger people that uh, want to join in via Zoom just to listen to a meeting might be encouraged to uh, take it a step further. And in the midst of all this, we thought it was a wonderful idea to hear from Bernard to Judy our full aid to the church in need. And 
and what a wonderful presentation we, we received. I'm just sorry that he had to leave to catch a plane back to Sydney because uh, it was a wonderful inspiration to us as to what we might do and how we can expand our activities. So uh, even in his absence, I'm very grateful for him coming to speak to us today. And I would pray that we, we actually benefit and begin to become more active in supporting aid to the church in need and other organizations throughout the church in a similar fashion. So I just want to conclude by saying that uh, all of those things come together as a package. And as Brother John Bruce mentioned, no one thing can be singled out and say, well, that's important. It's a package. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to uh, listen and learn and, uh, and participate in what we do going forward. And if you do, we'll all be the better for it. Thank you. Brothers, uh, Brother Carmen, you've got a late light of a business? Oh, you're just raising your hand, that was it. Okay, black 71. There's six items there. Once they're gone, they're gone. Oh, go collect. Go, go. Uh, number five, green five. Black 50. Yep. Black 95. Yep. Green 43. And Father Tony's got the sixth one. Go. That's it. All gone. Thank you for that, Brother Carmen, and thanks everyone. I think we're we're slightly ahead of time, but we'll uh, allow us a little bit of extra maternity. Uh, I'll now ask Father Karen to lead us in their closing prayers. And just a reminder, if some members could stay behind and just help with uh, restacking chairs, and then we're going to have some opportunity for friendship. And over to our State Chaplain, Father Tony Karen. Just a reminder, please take these uh, booklets home with you. Uh, and take some for the branch. You can distribute them. You carry it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The night's prayer. O oh God, let us all fellow members of the night's of the Southern Cross, and mainly, let us all have activity for our power of the Lord's time, for the work of your great and the salvation in the world. May the soul of the daughter of faith in the heart of the rest of peace. Amen. Pray to St. Mary of the Cross, the killer. My most lovely God, we take you for the example of St. Mary of the Cross. We are going to to the people who are going to be 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 the people who are Give those who are and 
We have the world peace and we remember the scriptures we pray. Lord of all, the world, 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 the Blessed be God, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be his most sacred heart, blessed be Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the all. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the power of peace, and the hope of heart. Blessed be the great mother of God, Mary, most holy. Blessed be the holy nature to the sinner. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of the heavenly Father. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be the holy nature of the sinner. Holy Mary, mother of God and of the church. Obtain for us any holy priests and religious. Lady, help the Christians, patroness of Australia. Pray for us. Saint Mary of the Scots and Philip, patroness of our order. Pray for us. For all departed members and their families, and an awareness in our society of the rights of the unborn child. I am Mary, the Lord of Christ, the bless us and keep us from all evil and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Oh, Sorry, it was remiss of me not to uh, tell everybody we actually uh, raised three hundred and fifty dollars on that raffle, and that was uh, donated then to um, the, the Bernie. Okay. Thank you very much, bro that. Bro brother. Please support the Education Fund, Chairman. Did you want to uh, oh. did you want to promote an event? Uh, while we've got everybody here, the flagship event of the order is happening on the North Friday, the 19th of August. Uh, please, please, our aim is to have 350 in attendance. Go back to your branches, book tables. Um, it's a fantastic evening once again. All right? Okay. Brothers, just remain standing. We'll have a Now, uh, we'll take a chance.